All right, so I'm Britton Harmon, and I stayed here in Utah and studied the Daughters of Utah Pioneer Museums. And this is my title of my thesis. Okay. There is a monument on the east side of the Daughters of Utah Pioneer Memorial Museum in Salt Lake City that depicts a mother and young son looking back on the small grave of their beloved daughter and sister as they continue along the Pioneer Trail. The plaque inscription reads, Ever pressing forward, lest we forget. This monument symbolizes the mission of the International Society Daughters of Utah Pioneers, or DUP. Since 1901, the DUP's mission has been to perpetuate the names and achievements of men, women, and children who were the pioneers by collecting all such data as shall aid in perfecting a record of pioneers. DUP historical libraries and artifact collections are distributed throughout Utah, Idaho, and Nevada amongst the Pioneer Memorial Museum and 114 local satellite collections, 97 of which are in Utah. So this is just kind of a crude map um, showing the collections and museums that are in Utah, and the green dots are where I focused my study. For me, Wandering around the Pioneer Memorial Museum for the first time was like time travel. The overall effect reminded me of the descriptions of 18th and 19th century cabinets of curiosity and early natural history museums. Objects were organized by type and lined up side by side under glass with minimal labeling. labeling. I walked by case after case filled with large collections of infant blessing gowns, paisley shawls, shoes, china sets, spinning wheels, rifles, tools, coffee grinders, and handmade quilts. The walls of every floor of the museum were covered with large black and white portraits of men, women, and children. Unlike most historical museum exhibits today, which display somewhat uncrowded representational artifacts, often in a narrative fashion, with timelines and educational texts that there was no apparent narrative in the DUP's manner of exhibition in the Pioneer Memorial Museum. The, TUP, the DUP's exhibition practice is governed by an open storage policy and has been in effect for almost 100 years. This policy dictates that approximately 90 to 95 percent of each museum's entire collection be displayed at all times so that artifacts once belonging to a Utah pioneer can be perpetually viewed by the pioneer's descendants. In this manner, the DUP ever presses forward so as to never forget each pioneer. During my field study, a few Utah museum professionals I interviewed expressed concern for the DUP's exhibition practices of open storage. They felt the DUP was missing opportunities to make pioneer history relevant to the local communities by ignoring the ability of the objects to help tell a larger story about the pioneer past. Their opinion was that the members were too close to the subject matter to look at it critically and objectively. Another concern was that continual display of the objects over many years would damage the objects by exposure to light and less than ideal temperatures for proper preservation. These professionals, like many others in the museum world, ascribe to modern, scientifically based conservation methods like those compiled in the book Conservation Concerns, published by the Smithsonian Institution. Best practices like these are an ideal which almost every museum strives for and can usually be only be followed best with large budgets, adequate space, and professional staff. I argue that in the case of the DUP, legitimate museum best practices, which focus on conservation, contextual storytelling, and historical education of the objects need to be rethought, for they cannot always be applied in this context. I claim the DUP's non-traditional practice accomplishes their goals to focus, focus more on the individual emotional connections made between visitors and their pioneer ancestors. Their self-labeled different practice, which encom encompasses these unique exhibition and curating policies, also contains useful management strategies larger museums and for-profit organizations can learn from, namely existing on smaller budgets, recruiting volunteers passionate about their work, and serving under a flat management structure. Studying these museums can ultimately broaden our view of what museums are and can be. Due to time constraints today, I will only focus on their exhibition and uh, curation uh, practices. 
In 2008, an article by Tammy S. Gordon in The Public Historian, sh um, she states that traditionally, scholars writing on historical exhibition have focused on highly professionalized exhibits in large publicly funded museums. This has left the majority of historical exhibitions and their techniques, functions, and social roles unstudied and leads to conclusions about exhibition practices that do not reflect the majority of visitor interaction with historical exhibits. This article greatly motivated my study of the DUP's non-traditional exhibition and curating practices. To find out more about their functions and social roles, I asked the curator of the Pioneer Memorial Museum to elaborate more on the theory behind their open storage policy. She said, it's not just that one brass bucket, and we need to show you what a pioneer brass bucket was. It's that brass bucket was owned by your great, great, great grandmother. So it's who owned the brass bucket that lends value to the artifact, not the specific artifact itself. When you have my job, every day you get to point someone to a specific artifact. It's an entirely different impulse. But did the theory actually work in practice? The curator claimed that on average, she gets around three to eight people daily asking to help them locate an, arti an ancestor's artifact. During my visits, I did witness this occurring a few times. However, through my observations and interviews at the smaller satellite museums, this occurred less often and in slightly different ways. Nevertheless, connections were still being made. For example, one afternoon, I observed a young man who was doing research on his ancestor in the Springville DUP Museum. At one point, he got up from the table and began searching the museum. After several minutes, he exclaimed, Oh, I tell you, this just made my day. I found the pocketbook of an ancestor. The docents shared in his excitement, and he thanked them for all the great information he had found that day. The pocketbook he discovered was tattered and threadbare, and most museums would have it kept tucked inside an acid-free storage box in, cold, uh, in dark, cold storage room. However, because of the DUP's open stores policy, this man was able to make his discovery and connect to his ancestor through this material object. Had there only been a representation of pocketbooks from the time of the pioneers, with no description of who they belonged to originally, this young man would not have been able to find the exact one that belonged to his ancestor. Although viewing a representation of objects from a certain time period may connect a visitor to that time period, beholding an artifact that belonged to an individual's own ancestor may create a more personal connection, one which pulls time, space, and people closer together. During an interview with one of the satellite directors, she told me a story about a moment of serendipity. She was cleaning out a display case when a man walked in and told her he was a descendant of Porter Rockwell, a famous bodyguard of Joseph Smith Jr. It just so happened that in the display case she was cleaning was Porter Rockwell's hat. So she placed it on the man's head and took a picture of him with his, with his camera so that he would have the memory forever. She told me he could have died and gone to heaven, right there. Although letting descendants touch the objects is not a normal occurrence, the directors who have made an occasional exception have never regretted it, saying it is more about the visitor and the descendant. I also saw how the DUP open storage policy works for their members who serve in the museum as docents or demonstration volunteers. In one such case, I interviewed a middle-aged woman demonstrating her pioneer ancestor's loom. She and her sister ha sisters had found the loom dismantled and rolled into bundles in their attic. Ten years ago, they restored it to working condition and donated it to the Pleasant Grove DUP Museum. She expressed to me, history museums are great, but you don't always have that connection like we do here. Now, there's a piece of us here. She went on to explain how they all feel more connected to the museum and their community now. During many tours, docents were able to point to their own ancestors' artifacts or photographs and use this connection to demonstrate their pioneer lineage to visitors. In such cases, the history of the community is wrapped up in the personal history of the DUP members serving in the museums and aids their storytelling. For example, when showing me a collection of chairs, I never got a rundown of typical pioneer craftsmanship and styles. Instead, I was told a quirky story about how one, my, one pioneer man had dressed up like a woman and sat rocking in one of the chairs to escape the mob. 
Stories like these motivated me to find my own ancestors' artifacts, and to my extreme excitement, I was able to find two. An apron belonging to my great-great-great-great-grandmother, and a letter written by her son, my great-great-great-grandfather. Unfortunately, the apron was slightly damaged, and the letter was an original document, so they were shut away in storage, and only available in photographs. I was glad they were being preserved, but disappointed I didn't get to see them in three-dimensional space where the relative size of the apron, or a stain or two, would have visually expressed to me even more about the grandmother I had heard so many stories about during my youth. I conclude that by studying the DUP's small and non-traditional micro-museums, a different type of museum pract is, practice is unraveled, one which accomplishes the organization's mission to perfect the record of Utah pioneers and to per perpetuate the pioneer legacy by connecting descendants to their ancestors. The DUP is able to accomplish this through their open storage policy. By only studying large museums, the professional museum world is overlooking the unique practices in small and non-traditional museums, such as the DUP. Trying to make some best practices fit into all museum settings will not work in this case. When the emotional connections to people living and dead are made through an object, the value of that object is the, in the emotional connection made, not in its longevity or its ability to tell a larger story. All museum professionals would do well to study small museum practices such as the DUPs, which challenge, which challenge their scientifically based ideologies and keep more treasures out of storage, one where people are the focus rather than material objects. Thank you. By looking at the densities of plant remains and comparing this data between the structures at Wolf Village, we can provide additional evidence towards domestic activities occurring in the structures at Wolf Village. We propose the idea that based on densities of plant remains, structures 1, 2, 4, and 5 were domestic pit houses and structure 3 and 8 may have been used for increased domestic activities or used for communal activities. This conclusion developed because structures 3 and 8 had higher densities of plant remains than structures 1, 2, 4, and 5. Examples of domestic activities can include eating and preparing food, whereas examples of communal activities could consist of feasting, trading, and rituals. Um, other supporting artifacts that we analyzed and included in our data set were monos and hearths. In order to accurately compare the remains of each structure, we calculated our surrogate and indicator of relative quantity of macrobotanical remains found within each structure. This surrogate indicator of relative quantity is the density of plant remains found in a single meter cubed of our excavated soil. Although faunal remains, pottery shards, and other artifacts may support our theory, we did not include them in our study. Instead, we focused on the plant remains and what they could tell us about the function of various structures at Wolf Village. Our plan for this presentation is to present our data, the anal analysis of the data, and discuss our concluding remarks. Um, Wolf Village is an archaeological site located near the town of Goshen, Utah. Ancient Native Americans, known as the Fremont, lived and worked in this region of eastern Great Basin. Um, the Brigham Young University F Archaeological Field School has spent the last five summers excavating at Wolf Village. During that time, nine structures have been excavated. Seven of these are the remains of pit structures, with one being the largest Fremont pit structure ever excavated. Um, the other two buildings were above ground adobe structures. The procedure that we used to identify as maize fragments focused on the separation of three species of maize common throughout the Fremont region, dent, flint, and flower. These species have been found at other Fremont archaeological sites. The germs of the different species of maize have defining characteristics that set them apart. These defining characteristics were used to identify the majority of maize fragments. The greatest quantity of maize found was the flower variety. The most common seed found at Wolf Village was the Indian rice grass. Today, Indian rice grass is being marketed by gluten-free companies as a type of flour. The second most common seed found at Wolf Village is Chinoponium, also known as goosefoot. These seeds were ground into meal and used as a staple food. There are many benefits to using Chinoponium as a staple. It lacks gluten, a common allergen found in wheat. It is also higher in calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, potassium, iron, copper, manganese, and zinc than any of the cereal grasses, such as rice, wheat, barley, oats, 
or corn and such maize. Mustard is still used today as a spice. Pollen analysis from monos uncovered within the floor zones suggests that Fremont people ground this seed. All the structures contain hearts, and a few of them contain monos in the floor zone. Um, at this point, I will describe each of the structures and present the densities of plant remains found within them. And so structure one is an uh, above ground adobe structure with a floor area of 22.7 meters squared. This structure contains storage rooms where a majority of the maze fragments were recovered. This structure also had large amounts of wild plant remains found within the hearth. The surrogate measurements are 0.74 maize fragments per meter cubed, 0.45 wild plant remains per meter cubed, and 1.19 total plant remains per meter cubed. Um, due to its larger size, which measures 71 meters squared, we thought we would find the largest number of plant remains in the floor zone of structure two. But when compared to the other structure, structure two had the fewest density of macrobotanical remains. This structure contained a mono as well. So the surrogate measurements are 0.28 maize fragments per meter cubed, 0.07 wild plants per meter cubed, and 0.35 total plant remains per meter cubed. Structure three is approximately 22 meters squared. The surrogate measurements are 1.61 maize fragments per meter cubed, 1.12 wild plants per meter cubed, and 2.73 total plant remains per meter cubed. Structure four is approximately 17 meters squared. The structure contained a mono in its floor zone. The surrogate measurements are 0.57 maize fragments per meter cubed, 0.25 wild plants per meter cubed, and 0 0.82 total plant remains per meter cubed. Structure five is an example to show the effects of erosion on a structure and its artifacts. Part of the structure had been eroded by the time it was excavated, but a floor zone was found. Within this structure, we found a low concentration of maize fragments and wild plant remains as compared to the other structures. The surrogate measurements are 0 0.08 maize fragments per meter cubed, 0 0.41 wild, plant, wild plants per meter cubed, and 0.49 total plant remains per meter cubed. Because the floor was unable to be identified in structures six and seven, we could not accurately compare their data to the other structures at Wolf Village. Although we cannot use the data for structure six, here is the data for your information. Um, and although structure eight was only partially excavated by the end of the 2013 field school season, the largest density of plant remains was recovered in its floor zone. A mono was also recovered in its floor zone. This suggests that it was used for greater domestic purposes than the other structures or it was used for communal activities. The surrogate measurements are 1.86 maize fragments per me meters cubed, 1.08 wild plants per meters cubed, and 2.94 total plant remains per meters cubed. As can be seen on this chart, the structures that had higher concentration of maize fragments and wild plant remains were structures three and eight. Though each structure contained varying amounts of plant remains, structures that had on average more maize fragments and wild plant remains were areas of higher amount of domestic activity or areas of communal activities. Monos were found in the floor zones of structures two, four, six, and eight, and all structures contained hearts. When the monos were analyzed, pollen re residue was found. This suggests that food preparation occurred within the structure. The densities of plant remains in each of the structures can provide additional evidence towards domestic activities occurring in them. Based on this, structures one, two, four, and five were domestic pit houses and structures three and eight may have been used for increased domestic activities or used for communal activities. So good afternoon, everybody. So in the spring of 2012, I participated in the BYU Archaeological Field School taking place at Wolf Village, a Fremont Native American site in Goshen, Utah, occupied between 650 AD to 1150. Since then, I have been studying the shell beads found at the site. More recently, however, I've started to wonder what those beads meant to the people who owned them. My question became, were the shell beads found at Wolf Village valuable objects to the people who owned them? 
as I argue in my thesis, it is not by looking at the beads themselves that archaeologists can determine if people valued beads or not. People don't necessarily value objects because they are rare or crafted in beautiful ways or because they come from far away, even though those characteristics surely can increase the value of things. Ultimately, objects are valuable because of the meaning we give them, not because of their market value or anything else. That meaning, as I will explain, can ultimately only be inferred by looking at the archaeological context. This is at the way people treated the objects. So I had to start with theory. There's too many types of value. And honestly, theoretical discussions about value are still open to much, much, much debate. Um, since, well, and yet only rarely have these debates been applied to archaeology since sentimental value specifically is regarded as too subjective and too ephemeral. Uh, besides, we cannot ask the people who own the objects uh, if they value the, the bees or not because obviously the people are gone. Uh, therefore, I am left with two steps to determine the bead's ultimate value. Uh, the first step looks at the artifact itself, at the observable characteristics of an object, such as its rarity, the apparent skill of the craftsman who produced it, and whether it was exchanged or not. The second step looks at the three-dimensional context where the beads were found. This, I argue, is the way to understand how people treated the objects, which uh, naturally depends on the emotional and or ritual attachment to the object. What I have done in my research and what I will present today is the method I have created to determine the extrinsic, sentimental, ritual value of objects. I argue that both steps are necessary, obviously, even though analyzing the context is ultimately much more significant in determining the value of shell beads or, for that matter, any type of artifact. So, in step one, I will just briefly mention the significance of exchange, exchange in determining the value of shell beads. Exchange is predominantly important in the creation of value, particularly in times where people didn't have trucks or cell phones to guarantee distribution. Uh, the shell beads I have studied certainly had some value, at least to the degree that would justify exchange all the way from their sources that are highlighted in green and purple and red to Wolf Village that is the small little triangle over there. So, uh, just think of the personal and or communal sacrifice involved in transporting those things from their source to um, the place where they actually ended up at Wolf Village. Uh, and also the political ties that had to be maintained between the parties involved. It, it's just huge. Um, step two, this is where I will <coughs> focus. Uh, it's to determine the beads value. Uh, the way we do that is to analyze how the people treated the beads based on their sentimental or ritual connection they had with the beads. So this is where uh, this is where they are found and what sorts of objects they are found with, uh, either with garbage or with other prestige artifacts. Uh, this context will point to the extrinsic value of an object, and it is in the assessment of this value <coughs> that I will continue my research. So my method to determine the extrinsic value of shell beads consists of analyzing the distribution, artifact association, completeness, and type of every shell bead. For the purpose of this presentation, I'll focus on what we call the midden layer of structure two, um, from which 89 out of the 214 marine shell beads uh, found at the site were uncovered. This number represents 41% of all the beads found at the site and definitely provides the most extraordinary context for the study of shell beads value at Wolf Village. Uh, this midden layer, it was accumulated after the structure collapsed on top of a burned roof. So that's also important for the context. It's not on the floor. So starting with distribution, this map shows the distribution of shell beads in the midden layer of structure two. Darker, more beads, lighter, less beads. Note that these are absolute frequencies, however, meaning that they represent the actual number of beads found in every square meter. Um, this map creates an illusion that all the beads are concentrated on the northern side uh, because, in reality, much of the southern half has been washed away, so it's not there. Um, it was only when I started to calculate the actual excavation vol volumes that the real pattern started to emerge. So there are five concentrations that are worth noting. 
The first, the first one is on the northwestern corner of the structure, the second one to the north of the entrance of the western tunnel, and all of these things on top, obviously, of the burned roof, so not on the floor. Uh, and also the highest concentration in one single square meter. The third on the north at the center, uh, the fourth in the southeastern corner of the structure, more scattered but still significant, and the fifth uh, and highest right on top of the entrance of the western tunnel. This distribution is interesting. The entrances to the tunnels uh, that are these two big uh, attachments to the main room, um, it's basically, they represent definitely something was going on at the entrances of those tunnels. Uh, also, the complementary corners of northwest and southeast look somewhat suspicious, and as does the concentration at the northern edge. Standing alone, however, uh, this distribution is still not sufficient to infer the value of marine shell beads. So let's jump to artifact association. I also looked at the distribution of beads compared to the distribution of other artifacts. Specifically, I compared shell beads with items that are rare or associated with prestige, and also with common garbage such as lithic debitage and faunal bone. I will start by explaining the distribution of refuse from everyday life, mainly lithics and faunal bone. So going back, to our highest concentrations of shell, four of these concentrations directly match some of the higher concentrations of refuse. Uh, this indicates that the beads in these places are concentrated because they are proportional to the amount of refuse found with them, not necessarily because they defy any pattern. So they just appear like lost beads. One exception remains, however, and this is above the entrance of the western tunnel. In this place, there are many, many beads, but not too many lithics, funnel bone, or even pottery shirts. Again, a special place. As for prestige artifacts, I decided to use figurines, you can see them in the map, turquoise and projectile points as my departing valuable objects. These are objects that are comparatively rare to common lithics and ceramics and bone, uh, and require a fairly large intentional and intel intelligent effort in the production and procurement. Um, as indicated in the map, figurines are almost always found with or very close uh, to shell beads and are more spatially associated with ceramic shirts than lithics and faunal bone. Still, figurines are not separated from refuse except on the southern edge of the structure, right here, um, he, where really there isn't too much of anything but figurines. Around the entrance of the eastern tunnel, we also found the only three pieces of turquoise in structure two. Uh, I don't know about you, but this looks a little bit weird to me. Uh, finally, um, guess where the highest concentration of projectile points is, is exactly by the highest concentration of shell beads in, on top of the western tunnel, 24 projectile points indeed. Um, one last step is the type and completeness of shell beads. Um, at the site, beads that keep the body of the shell, we call them barrel beads or spiral loop beads, but to simplify barrel beads, um, tend to be more often complete. 56% of these are actually complete. Beads that are made from the wall of the shell, uh, disc beads, and then a hole is pierced in the middle, tend to be more often broken. 76% of these are broken. Um, so this map shows the distribution of broken uh, disc beads and barrel beads uh, compared basically by color. So the squares, they, they identify just the complete beads and the triangles are the broken beads, the red are the barrel beads and the black ones are the um, disc beads. So you, by looking at this map, we confirm that more disc beads were broken and more barrel beads are complete. We also see that inside the structure in the midden, barrel beads and disc beads are very mixed. Uh, and even though this map does not show such detail, even specific types, presumably diagnostic of specific time periods, are found everywhere in the structure, even on the floor with beads that were presumably made a thousand years later. So, our concentration of beads on the top of the western tunnel also represents the highest concentration of broken beads uh, and they are mostly representing different types. So this is my conclusion. I believe that the Shelby's found at Wolf Village were probably not very valuable in everyday life or at a personal level, sentimental level. 
if you think of the beads as pennies, if you lose one, you will probably not care very much about that. But when you go to a fountain and throw the penny in the water as part of a ritual to get what you want, then the penny acquires a completely different meaning. I believe that the entrance to the Western, the Western Tunnel is a fountain of pennies, basically. If uh, it has the largest concentration of marine shell beads, most of which are broken. And please note that in, in many cultures, people purposefully broke, break objects in ceremonial contexts. Uh, this is also the largest concentration of projectile points. This concentration of shells is complementary with concentrations of turquoise on the east and figurines on the south. Uh, so it's very strategic. Not many funnel bones, lithics, and ceramic shirts are found at the entrance of the Western Tunnel. Uh, the fire that burned down the structure, according to Lauren Davis, who wrote her senior thesis last year, started in the Western Tunnel. Uh, and ritually bearing structures is not alien to Native American groups in the American Southwest. Finally, and very importantly, shell necklaces were probably very valuable objects. The necklaces, not the beads, since we don't find any necklaces. At Caldwell Village, also a Fremont site, archaeologists found a necklace of shell beads in a burial context. So that's way more revealing. Unlike shell beads, necklaces and bracelets are more likely to have inspired an emotional connection to their owners. Beads, however, are still part of that whole, so in ceremonial context, it does not seem utterly illogical that they were used as a sample of a necklace, a necklace perhaps too valuable to discard in ritual contexts. Thanks. I have a few things to say. Um, Maybe a few things I won't say in a public context about uh, a couple of things as well, uh, but we might need to discuss. <laughs> but let's first off, let me say about Burton Harmon's paper, um, I think it's really interesting, and this idea that the personal connection is, is what really matters is, um, or at least in some context is what really matters, I think is, is, is really an interesting idea and I think it's probably true that being able to, to make that connection to your ancestor and to your ancestors things um, really is an important way that people um, actually connect as opposed to just sort of looking at a whole bunch of old stuff right but you make that personal connection um, makes me think that I probably should dig out that old broken down um, cedar chest that my great-grandfather great-great-grandfather hauled across the plains um, on a handcart. I've got it stashed in what the British would call the cupboard under the stairs in my basement. Um, <laughs> haven't looked at it for years. It, is in, it doesn't have a lid. It's in terrible repair, but it's there because of that, you know, there's that connection. Um, of course, it's not out on display and you can't see it. Um, but that kind of connection, I think, is really important. Um, I think my biggest question, though, is when we, if you pitch it as you know, what can the big museums learn from the little museums? I'm not sure it's scalable. I'm not sure you can really do that in a big museum um, to the same extent that you can in a, you know, you take a small Utah town and you've got, the, you know, people who grew up in that town and their ancestors' things are there in the DUP museum. Um, if everything goes to Salt Lake, first off, there's not room to put it all on display. And secondly, the, the personal connections become much harder. So. I think it's an interesting idea that um, the larger museums maybe should think more about how they can establish those personal connections, but I don't think they're going to be able to directly translate that DUP model. But it's, it's interesting, and I, and I enjoyed it. Um, Heather and Jacqueline's paper on work shirts, um, I, I'm impressed at how far you've come from. We struggled in lab class with Heather and Jacqueline both wanting to do something with work shirts. And, but what and how to separate, you know, divide things up and what was going to, you know, and um, so I, I think that the the detailed analysis is, is is really good, and I'm glad that you've done it and you've figured out what we really have with the work shirts now. Um, what do you have a week left? <laughs> maybe maybe there's not enough time to do this. Um, but I think now now what you have to do is think about why we should care. Right now that you've done all that, and what is the connection? What does it mean? Why is it that people at Wolf Village are recycling all this pottery into various things, you know? And and really, why, you know, just just why? Why should we care? What what does it what does it mean? I think it means something, but I think that, um, and I think that what you've done 
was really a necessary step to get to to answering that other question. But there's that question still just sort of hangs out there. You know what? Now that you now that you've really looked closely at what's there, what are you gonna what are you gonna do with that? What are you gonna say about it? What does it mean? You know why why does it tell us anything? Um, as far as um, Dustin and Mary's paper, I've got some. I've got some big questions, and there are some things we should probably talk about here. Um, for one, I'm not at all convinced that looking at plant remains on the floor of structure two is going to tell you that it's not a communal structure, right? I mean, the thing took us years to excavate, literally. There, it's, not like, it's not one family's house. Some guy didn't just build it in an afternoon and move his family in. It's a, it's a monumental building. It's got to be communal just on that basis alone. Um, but I think also the question ought to come up that, you know, there, there's, a, there's a whole literature on uh, communal architecture architect in archaeology, in the archaeology of the southwestern U.S. A lot of that literature talks about the fact that communal buildings often are used for domestic activities. So whether there's evidence for domestic activities or not in this building that on, on other grounds has to be communal. I think that's interesting to try and establish, and it's something uh, we started to try thinking about. Um, but finding evidence of domestic activity or, or not or whatever, none of that's, especially just looking at plant remains, it's not going to tell you uh, whether, I mean, it just isn't going to answer the question that you're trying to answer, I think. Um, I've got big questions about lots of details. First off, Dustin, you said three species of maize. If you've got three species of maize, we need to call the national press, maybe the international press. If there's one species of maize, you've got three varieties. And the details matter, right? Those little details matter. And there's a bunch of other details I really had trouble figuring out in the written version of the paper as well as the presentation. Um, I know that to some extent you guys are relying on data that, that Wendy Daly has in her master's thesis, but I can't tell what's her data and what's your data. Um, I can't tell. So the, the density of plant and range in structure two, how many flotation samples were actually analyzed from structure two? I can't tell, right? It's not even in the paper. Um, when you talk about the plant remains per volume, is that volume of dirt floated or volume of dirt excavated? Because we aren't seeing any seeds in anything unless we, you know, unless we do the flotation. Um, if you're going to try and answer that question, what happened to the beans? There's 90 beans out of structure two. It's probably more beans than pieces of maize. Um, other issues have to do with just the nature of the site. It's a big, complicated site. I have trouble getting my head around a lot of the details. But there's a floor in structure six. There's a floor in structure seven. You guys are saying we're not defining floors. We defined floors, but we had difficulty separating a floor artifacts from artifacts above because the burned roofs are lying directly on the floor. Um, so, and those are details, but again, the details matter. And um, getting it right, it's all about, it's all really all about getting the details right and then putting it in the proper context. So there's some things we should talk about there. Um, I think it's good that we're, we're looking at the, at the plant remains closely. I'm not sure the question you're trying to answer is the right question though, right? I mean, I just don't, I think that there's going to, I expect evidence for domestic activities in every structure of the site. Right. Um, even though I think we know that structure two at least is communal, regardless of what you find in terms of the So there's some things we should talk about there. Um, with Mariana, um, again, I think, you know, in all these cases, I think I, everybody's putting in a lot of work, and I'm sorry if I was a little negative there, but I think there's some things we really need to talk about. Um, and again, Mariana's looked. Um, a lot of the shell beads and where they're found. Um, a question, again, back to the details. Where did you go? So you said at one point there were 89 beads in the midden from, of stru from structure two. And this is midden that's sitting above, so the structure burned down. There's a collapsed burned roof on the floor, and then there's midden up above it that is uh, a really strange deposit and possibly an intentional uh, deposit on top of the roof. Um, but he said 89, but then he showed us a map and he, and he highlighted certain squares and the total number of beads in the squares oh. you highlighted is more than 89? Yeah, because that's the ratio for excavation volume to show beads. That's not the real number of show beads. That's not the real, okay. Okay. 
So there, those are rounded off numbers? They're, yeah, they're multiplied by a million, so we can see them, because there's okay. not that many shows. Okay. All right, so I didn't, I didn't quite understand that. Still, I thought it was more than 89, but again, it's a huge yeah, site, and we've got 100,000 artifacts, and I don't know where every single one came from anymore. <laughs> if I ever did, I'm sure I never did. Um, <laughs> Um, questions I have, though, you talked about figurines being more spatially associated with shell beads than other kinds of artifacts. With ceramics. With ceramics. They, they, they follow very much the pattern of ceramics, but they how, follow as well. Though. But how are you determining that? Is that just looking at maps? Uh, by doing the excavation volume ratio by uh, square and for lithics, ceramics, and funnel bone. And lithics and funnel sure. bone don't follow very well the pattern. Of but what do you, okay, so what do you mean by follow the pattern? Are you just mapping it out and looking at maps? Are you doing, are you, are you looking for correlations in the volumes? I mean, there's all sorts of stuff. We teach, we do teach <coughs> classes on quantitative methods, right? And there's, and there's stuff you could do. Looking at correlation, square to square would be one good thing. There's some techniques which we don't actually cover in quantitative methods, but you could ask me about for actually looking at spatial distributions um, to get beyond that just sort of it looks to me like it's it's because you know I you, you said that and I said yeah, I just kind of squinted and said yeah maybe right but but it's not that's not very well established and I think there's there's um, deeper analysis you could do um, with it and again we still have so and correct me if I'm wrong, Mariana, but you're suggesting that the concentration at the entrance to the western tunnel looks like a, a deliberate deposition of beads, but the rest of it you think is probably just sort of random bead loss going on. Okay. But again, and we talked about this, was that the day before yesterday or something? You still have to figure out, if you're trying to figure out, okay, even if it's random bead loss, again, this is, I mean, People have been doing archaeology in the Fremont region for over a century. There are, um, we've got tabulations of all the marine shell ever found before we excavated at Wolf Village. It's less than a thousand. So suddenly we've got 200 beads, we've got 89 in that one midden out of that one structure. So even if it's random loss, why are they randomly losing so dang many beads? You know? I mean, compared with everybody else, it's, I mean, it may be random within the structure. But it's not random with regard to the whole framework world, right? And and so it just raises it raises questions and th and things to try and, and think about and figure out. Just you know, um, it may well be that people are just losing beads. But if they're losing beads at a higher rate, it means they're probably using beads at a higher rate. They're doing something different there that's causing them to lose those beads at a higher rate. So so. Still, lots of questions, and that's the way it always is. As the more you Isn't do, the more questions. Is it because you excavated are. better, Jim? <laughs> um, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> it, it, it may have something to do with consistently using screens when we excavated, but I don't think that's all of it by any means. I think there's, you know, there's lots of places where people screened and didn't find that many beats. So, um, but you know. If that's the if someone wants to make that argument, let's see an argument for that being the, the reason, you know, instead of just assuming it. So anyway, good job everyone. Um, more work to do and maybe more things to think about even after the semester's over. I mean, some of this stuff, if you keep working on it, there's places to publish it, there's things you can do, right? I mean you can you can really do stuff if you stick with it, if you really pay attention to the details and the context, you can make a big contribution to our understanding of Freeman archaeology because we don't know anything. And as far as museums, I don't think. <laughs> I can't say the same thing, but maybe I just don't know. But I think that it's a, an interesting um, topic and I think worth pursuing and, and trying to see if you can convince museum professionals to think about those things more. Anyway, that's what I have to say.